Hello, everyone. Welcome to the USC Institute on Inequalities and Global Health virtual lecture series. My name is Sophia Gruskin, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this incredibly exciting event, Sexual Health and Human Rights at the Intersections, Global Norms and Local Realities. This event is done in partnership with the United Nations University International Institute on Global Health and the World Health Organization's Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research Human Reproduction Program, and co-sponsored by the Occidental College John Park Young Initiative on the Global Political Economy. So on our collective behalf, welcome. Um, I wanted to say a little bit in terms of how this came together. Several of us on uh, this panel were part of a series of workshops and discussions at Occidental College that resulted in the publication of a book, Human Rights at the Intersections, if you can see this, which focuses on the challenges to human rights in the current moment and ways to think about invigorating the human rights paradigm to address really the complicated world in which we find ourselves now. The book takes as its premise that the power of human rights is their ability to be continuously broadened and reimagined. And for this to happen, there has to be a constant interplay between the local and the global and in a variety of domains. So sexuality, sexual rights, reproductive rights emerged as a key theme. And so with this session, we hope to explore the similarities and differences and the challenges that we're facing across the world and really try to begin to learn from the variety of experiences of the folks working on these issues, what these challenges mean for our research, for our teaching, for our activism, but really for, for our lives. Um, I do want to say one key thing about the book is that, yes, it's beautiful. Please note again that it's beautiful, but that it's open access. So you may not get the beauty of the hardcover, and you should, of course, purchase it and purchase it as often as you like, but it's free and downloadable, which I think is super exciting. So please, uh, if you're interested, uh, do, do get it for, for yourselves. And, and this is one in a series of events that is using the book as a jumping off point. So moving right into this amazing session, I honestly could not ask for a better panel of leaders to be in dialogue with on these issues. So I'd like to introduce everyone all at once. Um, but I do want to say to the audience, I'm going to do no one justice. So I'm going to introduce people really briefly, but please do look their bios up because this really is an incredible uh, panel. So uh, Pascal Alate is the director of the World Health Organization's Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research uh, and the, the Special Program of Research Development and Research Training in Human Reproduction. And she is, even before this, a globally recognized expert in sexual and reproductive health and rights. And her recent work includes challenging the boundaries of global health advocating for accountability in the decolonization of global health and international development, and expanding opportunities to diversify the voices of contributors to global debates and decision making. Momin Ragman is a professor of sociology at Trent University in Canada. His current research is on the conflicts between LGBTQ identities and Muslim cultures and the experience of LGBTQ Muslims, including a funded research project on LGBTQ Muslims in Canada. He's published over 35 chapters and articles and four books, including the Oxford Handbook on Global LGBT and Sexual Diversity Politics, Homosexualities, Muslim Cultures and Modernity, and Gender and Sexuality and Sexuality and Democracy. And Kate Gilmore, former UN Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights, is currently Chair of the Board for International Planned Parenthood Federation, Honorary Professor at Essex University's Human Rights Center, and Professor in Practice at the London School of Economics and Political Science. She's also Vice Chair of Interpeace, Co-Chair of the WHO Gender and Human Rights Advisory Panel on Human Reproduction, and a member of the WHO Immunization Agenda 2030. Uh, partnership panel. Elorm Ama Ababio, popularly known as Ama Governor, is a Ghanaian YouTuber, social media influencer, swimming professor, and lawyer in waiting. And in November 2022, she was denied the call to the Ghana bar, even though she'd completed the law program and passed her exams and scaled her interview session because a quote unquote concerned citizen, whose identity, as I understand to this date, has not yet been disclosed, petitioned the General Legal Counsel to suspend her call to the bar indefinitely 
recently on the grounds that she is unfit to become a lawyer. And this has sparked a wave of activism in support of Ms. Ababio's and right to private life and freedom of speech and expression. And last but not least, uh, Rajat Kosla, who's director of the United Nations International Institute on Global Health based in Malaysia, where he leads a portfolio of work on global health and inequalities through the intersection of research policy and practice. His present research agenda includes racism and global health, social justice accountability, and gender and digital health governance. He most recently served as senior director for research advocacy and policy at Amnesty International, and has previously held appointments at the World Health Organization and the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, amongst other places. So you can see what a pan, right? So just one last piece of housekeeping before getting into this as an audience. If you could drop any questions in the Q&A function and we'll come to the questions at the end. And I'm gonna run this myself as a series of questions where hopefully everyone can and will engage, where I'm gonna ask one person to lead off and then hopefully everybody can, can join in from there. Uh, but I did wanna ask everybody if we can go around and if you can just orient us to the kind of work you do, the framing that you bring to thinking about and addressing sexual and reproductive health and rights, just so folks get a sense of who you are and the framing you bring to this conversation. Just because of where you're on my screen, Raja, do you mind if I start with you? Thank you, thank you, Sophia. And, uh, and, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us uh, for this conversation. Um, as Sophia said, uh, I am presently the director for the United Nations University International Institute on Global Health. The Institute is the designated think tank for the United Nations on global health. What we do is uh, we work on generating evidence on a variety of issues related to global health. We work in terms of working with policymakers to ensure policy shift based on evidence-based advocacy and the evidence generation that we do both through our research, but also through amplifying research of other organizations. We also work in terms of building capacity of health policymakers and programmers on, on these issues. Our entry point on sexual and reproductive health and rights essentially comes from the intersection of the work on gender equality and human rights. The International Conference on Program and Development very famously talked about the basic right of all couples and individuals to intimacy, to whom to marry, to be able to procreate or not to procreate in a manner that say that they deem so fit. If you look at it from that perspective, there are three or four issues that stand out, which is what we from the International Institute on Global Health focus on issues around autonomy of individuals to make those decisions, the agency of individuals to be able to make those decisions to fulfill their basic right, and the choice that they have, both in terms of access to services and commodities, but also the choice to make the decision with regards to intimacy, with regards to procreation, with regards to marriage, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, it becomes a question of voice is what we tend to amplify, voice of communities, of individuals, of those denied these access and opportunities as well. For us, therefore, issues around sexual and reproductive health and rights are ultimately a question of power and power asymmetries that determine whether individuals are able to realize their reproductive rights and freedoms and able to achieve the justice in doing so. Thanks, Sophia, for having me. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh... Mamin, just because of where you are, if that's okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Um, nice to see you all here. Um, so I um, work mostly on um, issues around queer LGBTQ uh, Muslims. Um, part of that work is um, what Rajat just talked about in terms of giving voice to people who are identify in some way as queer and some way as Muslim. Um, and I guess a lot of my work is focused on the political and social discourses that have made those voices invisible or politically impossible. Um, and so I'm trying to challenge that notion that, um, first of all, that there's some inherent dichotomy um, between um, queerness and um, Muslim cultures. But I'm based in the global north, um, and I've, uh, I'm in Canada, and I'm originally from Britain. I have Bangladeshi heritage. 
Um, and so one of the things I'm conscious of is the ways in which having those fairly difficult debates and discussions and dialogues between um, Muslim cultures and um, queer uh, rights um, needs to be attentive to the fact that in the West, Muslim minorities are stigmatized as suffering from Islamophobia. And so my take on that kind of debate has been that we have to think about these things, you know, in a complex interconnected way um, so that we're not reinforcing either racism in the West or Islamophobia more generally um, globally. Um, but I think the more difficult part of that has been that it's also, we, we should be able to critique and have a dialogue with Muslim leaderships who try to um, buy into that dichotomy um, and often deny the local traditions of gender and sexual diversity. And that's where the contribution to the book um, that Sophia mentioned um, really starts to begin to explore in the context of Bangladesh, a Muslim majority country that has traditions of gender and sexual diversity, um, particularly around hijra or what we might understand as third sex, and yet is, is quite anti this notion of what in the West we might understand as LGBT. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that a lot of that work um, is being done with my colleague Adnan Hussein, um, who is uh, from Bangladesh originally. Um, he can't be here today because he's at a job interview. So that's a reasonable, um, reasonable uh, reason for him not to be here. But I just want to acknowledge that I'm you know, very grateful and dependent on his contributions to that. And we will hope he gets the job. So, <laughs> so with that, uh, so Kate, please. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I, I think I'm, uh, I can say I'm, I'm thinking of, I'm trying to work on uh, three main areas. Uh, one is to, with IPPF, explore how we might operationally transform our working paradigm, if you like, from disease to delight or from injury to pleasure in the broad space of providing services, information and empowerment on sexual and reproductive health and rights. Key component of that is thinking about how to both uh, dig out uh, exfoliate uh, all um, uh, remnants and uh, current presences of racism, classism, and other bigotries that, that linger in some of the constructions of sexual and reproductive health and rights. But trying to think about that in practice terms. More on a research term, I'm very interested in the historical manufacture of anti-abortionism and the political usefulness of that uh, to uh, anti-state and anti-democracy -demo actors. And I'm intrigued by the history of financial backing uh, for that manufacture and how it, it remains a, a current influence on uh, much of the pushback against sexual and reproductive health and rights, including directly influencing the sort of experiences that I hope we'll hear more about it, that, uh, um, Alarm has is uh, encountering so unjustly in Ghana. Uh, the third area, though, is is with all that in mind, thinking about what does it mean to stand up for sexual and reproductive health and rights as defenders of those rights, and trying to map out the sort of aggression that is now being experienced on a huge scale by uh, people who are doing their best to defend all our rights to sexual and reproductive health. Uh, and uh, thinking about what we can do to use law, policy, and the human rights mechanisms to better protect midwives, gynaecologists, community health workers, sex educators, uh, activists working on uh, transgender, comprehensive sexuality education, so on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ama, can I turn to you next? Of course, yes, hello, hello, friends. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Sophie and everyone else for having me. My name is Elom Ama Governor Ababio. I am 24 years old. I, for the purpose of this program, I am a digital content creator living in Ghana. And among other things, my content focuses on essentially representing the lifestyle of queer people living in Ghana. Apart from that, I also document 
videos on YouTube, Instagram. These are some of my platforms, YouTube, Instagram, uh, Twitter. Yes, TikTok as well, um, to mention a few. And these are the ways in which I represent queer people like me who live in Ghana. For context, I am a queer woman. I identify as pansexual and my pronouns are she, her. And yes, yeah, so essentially, when I started doing content creation, I, I myself was in the closet, so I, I didn't do much at the time. And then in second year in law school, through law school and other things, I was strengthening to come out. But when I came out, it took me a while to start doing any type of work for people like me because I had freshly come out. But then again, further into the law, and I'm sorry, for context, I was in law school. Um, Sophie mentioned that, Sophia, forgive me. So I was in law school and I was learning everything I needed to learn to strengthen myself, to arrange my affairs accordingly so that I am never in conflict with the law because the career I was pursuing, that's being a lawyer, depended on me showing that I uphold the laws. So I was very intense. You're a bit frozen. Forgive me, am I back? me yeah. am I back now yes you are okay yes great. you are um so when I started I started Twitter and I started the um non-partisan political route of uh speaking of the rights of the sexual minority in Ghana and the backlash from that was tearing on my mental health and so I had to make a decision whether to stop completely or to continue. I chose to continue but I chose a different route uh, which was representation instead of going the political legal argumentative route on Twitter especially. And I also noticed people would bring to my attention that it isn't even the smart thing to do right now because I am just climbing the ladder to get to be a lawyer. I'm not protected at all. I need to be conscious. I need to be self-aware self of where I'm at. And also my financial situation and my family's background, we're not, you know, according to the classes, we're not anywhere there. So I need to move wiser for right now and then fight a bigger fight later. And so I stopped doing that and, you know, presenting the law and making legal submissions on uh, Twitter, which I realized was not too effective because these people are not people with legal minds. They tend to argue back without really processing anything that I had said before. And so I started creating content, showing my lifestyle and sharing my experience as a queer woman in Ghana. So I would tell you everything. So it's not the case that you go back to any of my platforms and you see differently. So among my content, you see that I, I detailed my IUD journey on YouTube because like again, when I was trying to, when I started having, to, ah, wow, this takes me all the way back, doesn't it? This sure. is too much out in, but basically I covered stories on my IUD journey to inform women like me who also didn't have the opportunity to get maybe a mother figure. Because I don't know about where you are, but here in Ghana, your parents don't talk to you about sex. They don't talk to you about any sex related activities. They don't talk to you about anything in preparation for that journey in your lifestyle honestly I think they hope you never have sex until the <laughs> way you know which is not very realistic for a lot of us so um what I tend to do is to use my experiences and also I would go to the hospital and ask the doctors or the nurses that if I could film them so they give direct information so it's not the case that maybe if I'm rephrasing or paraphrasing it's lost in translation so they get the information straight from the medical officers to the audience so this is the kind of thing I would do. Apart from that, I would also talk about my personal experiences approaching women in Ghana as a queer woman myself. Or I would also talk about sex life in particular and invite older people, younger people, or oh no, well, not younger people. My, I would take myself as a younger person, invite older people to come. We would say that we are not sexologists. We would state this explicitly in, our, in my videos that we're not sexologists. This, we're just speaking from experience to bridge the gap between you know, when you're about to transition into your sex life. So um, essentially I'm thinking that I'm here for the local realities part because this line of work that I chose to do, this line of advocacy for the rights of the legal, uh, of the sexual minority that I chose to do ended up 
ended me up in a place that I'm still currently fighting to get out of. And so, yeah, that's what I think the legal realities part is, you know, the disparity between what we want the global norm to be around these topics versus what actually happens when people dare to realize these these ideal things that we have in mind to, um, you know, realize. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we're really glad you're with us. Right. Um, Pascal, please. Oh, well, isn't that a tough act to follow? Right. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I, 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 I really would like to say a uh, big congratulations, Sophia, for uh, the panel you've put together because it really is, is uh, the, the spectrum from the, the local reality check um, to um, the, the, uh, uh, the sort of underwhelming bit about myself that I'm about to uh, talk about um, compared to that. But yes, yeah, so uh, sorry, starting off, good morning, Sophia, um, and good day, colleagues. Um, really delighted that you're, you're all here and listening to this conversation. So I come to this conversation as a Ghanaian woman. Um, a multinational through marriage, um, an international civil servant um, through work. Um, I'm a midwife, a public health researcher and practitioner um, with some technical competence on issues of health systems, gender, equity and human rights and sexual and reproductive health. And obviously of relevance um, is my position as director of the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research in WHO. Um, which, which is, a, um, as you know, a multilateral and therefore really, really critical for us to be able to, to engage with and listen to these conversations to, to provide us with the reality check of, of the, the norms, the normative work and guidance that uh, we provide to countries. Now, sexual and reproductive health, um, for me, I think is significantly different from any other area of health. A uh, healthy and enjoyable sex life within the definition of sexual health from WHO implies, obviously, that there is another person. Um, there's another person for a pregnancy to occur. There is another person for a sexually transmission, tra transmissible infection to happen. Um, uh, e even though some of us grew up with the myth of getting these things from public toilets. Um, the, the relational nature therefore introduces a power dynamic, which also introduces the potential for the misuse and abuse of power, which intersects with all of the is 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 isms, the racism, sexism, colonialism, and so on. And so fundamental to how I frame these issues um, what do we need to do within the space? Um, what is it? What do we need to do within the space of and mandate of global health to ensure that regardless of these relationships, bodily autonomy, the inviolability of the physical body, my body, your body is sacrosanct with e equitable access to the services and technologies to ensure health and well being. I need to be able to live free of violence, free of mutilation, and free to make the choices about my body. And my job gives me the responsibility to help where I can to make this a possibility for all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, everybody, amazing, right? Um, this is an amazing group. I mean, my only concern is the time because I, I just, there's there's so much I want to ask and so so much, and I want to make sure that there's some time for, for folks who are listening as well. Let me jump right in, if I may, to um, a question around law and, and court decisions and the ways that they have differential impacts on different populations. And just to say that here in the U.S., there's increasingly efforts, as everybody knows, around the world to restrict sexual and reproductive rights in increasingly unprecedented ways, right? But they impact us all, but often it is Black and Latinx populations in poor communities who are most affected. So I'd like to ask you to go around and ask about the restrictions to sexual and reproductive rights you all see in your own work and where you live that you're most concerned with and how you see this impacting inequalities. And, and Momin, may I start with you? Um, 
uh, it's saying unmute myself, but I think I'm unmuted. You're, right? you're unmuted. You're unmuted. Yeah. Okay. There's I a button <laughs> saying unmute myself. Okay. I'm just going to ignore that. Um, yeah, I think um, we've just completed a study on um, queer Muslims in Canada. And one of the things, and we're, we're just sort of writing out the data and the themes are kind of fairly apparent. One of the things that's um, apparent from a more, if you like, the more positive side of Canada as a regime where there's lots, there's, you know, we're in the top layer of countries that have citizenship rights and public policy. Um, and yet um, those, the implementation of those rights by mainstream queer groups, for example, who are mostly kind of white dominated, um, don't account for differences in accessing either queer spaces or queer rights by racialization in this case. So, you know, people who are Muslim um, are mostly racialized in Canada. Um, and so there's a, there's, um, there's this kind of idea that, you know, we have these rights and everyone can access them as you've kind of spoken about. But in fact, equality isn't just the law, right? It isn't just rights, it's actually a resource. And I think it's useful for us to think about equality as a resource and like, do does everybody have access to that resource? You know, or is that resource in full measure available to people? And it often isn't. Um, so we've seen, for example, here that, um, you know, policies around organizing are based on a public identification of your queerness, right? Being able to access the kind of lobbying organizations um, or even the queer organizations um, and yet for many Muslims, they don't want to be out to every sphere of their um, community, right? So particularly the family or their family's wider community. So that makes it difficult to, um, to access those positive range of rights. So that's something I think we also have to think about um, in terms of how we frame that positive version of rights and does it include everyone? And there's a question in the chat there about um, access to clinical practice. And it, it, this is one of the real tensions. If people are not visible, if the voices are not heard and their experiences aren't heard, how do we make sure that they have access to this full range of resources? And that's, I think, partly where research comes in, right? We can do research and it can be anonymized and we can say, but this is a credible study and this is what we need. Um, so that's that's one example from the global um, north. Um, in Bangladesh, going back to the chapter, what we're, and we're exploring some more work on that now. Um, the there is a movement towards recognizing Hydra as what we might understand as the third gender identity, and even providing some reserved government jobs because there's a recognition that it's an economically dislocated population. And yet, those rights, um, and this is the nuance that we must understand in every culture. Those rights are not being used as a framework or a blueprint or a wedge for wider rights of sexual freedom and autonomy for what we might think of as LGBT or queer identities. Um, so that is, it's it's one interpretation, which is a negative one, but one that we're kind of wrestling with is, you know, is the advance of that particular narrowed version of gender diversity um, actually being used to shut down access to other forms of rights in terms of um, sexual autonomy, sexual health. Um, and that's one of the things we have to be very cautious about in this period of fairly um, extreme um, transnational organization, often from religious you know, communities to, um, to, to kind of paint queer rights as um, you know, a threat to the nation or the civilization or the region or um, the culture. Thanks. Uh, it's, totally. Um, anybody else want to jump in on this question? Um, you're such a... Rajat, please. Uh, thanks, Sophia. Very, very briefly to build upon what uh, Momin was uh, so eloquently putting forward. I think in our work, what we are seeing increasingly is how, uh, how gender and sexual reproductive health and rights and law related to these issues is becoming the new uh, fault line against which global health policies and strategies are being discussed and negotiated. 
when you look at it from that perspective, what we are finding out that uh, that we are finding law interacting with these issues of gender, sexuality, SRHR, in about two or three different ways. And first is the law as manifestation of state power and state control. I think the Supreme Court judgment in the United States on Roe v. Wade, the recent decision uh, by the Texas court on the access to misoprostol is a very clear indication. And there are several from other parts of the world as well. These are just two very uh, ripe uh, examples to be citing how law is being used to exert power and control over individuals' rights and ability to realize their sexual reproductive health and rights. The second is law being used as a manifestation of patriarchy and patriarchal control, both in terms of the language that is often used to describe issues around sexuality, sexual reproductive health, but also how these legislations are being developed and applied. For those who were following the negotiations at the Commission on Population and Development last week would know one of the big fallouts of that whole negotiation for which there was no agreed consensus was the references to comprehensive sexuality education. So it's a patriarchal control that the law is being used to exert on what information we would want young people to have and what information we will deny and how we will manage that. And then ultimately, law is a manifestation of politics. We have seen that increasingly inch forward on how politics is being brought in, in terms of controlling what Pascal very nicely put it as bodily autonomy of individuals' right to decide on their bodies, their rights. And one of the best examples of that is with regards to adolescent sexuality and sexual reproductive health, or how, for that matter, issues in terms of pathologization of intersex communities and persons is playing out where the politics is being used to determine the individual bodily manifestations of these issues. Back to you, Sophia. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I just, you know, one of the things is, is we all know that even when there's good law, that that isn't sufficient, right? And and so one of the things that I that I really want to focus on that really comes out of what you just said is kind of the gap that we see often, even when there's a good law between what's written on paper and what happens in practice and what actually, how law actually impacts people's lives. And, and you know, I, I guess my, my question to you as a group is what you see really as the immediate, the long-term impacts of the legal environment and how it plays out in practice for the sexual and reproductive rights of, of the communities that you work with. And I guess, so, as you didn't speak this last round, Amma, can I start with you? Is that okay? Oh, no. Unfortunately, I have to be honest and say to this particular question, as to that disparity, I can't speak to it. Unless, okay. can you come again with the question so I be sure? No, sure, no, no worries. I mean, no worries. I mean, really, it's about the gap between law and practice. Right. And just in terms of thinking the communities that you work with, the impacts of kind of thinking about what, what that, that looks like. If you like, we can go around and come back to you if you prefer. Sure. Yes, I'd love that. but we'll come back. We'll come back to you to you quickly. Um, somebody who didn't speak in the last round, Kate. Do you mind? Do you want to take this on? Um, I think it's in, important to um, take real benefit from what uh, Rajat and Mamin have have said, and to notice that law and its impact is not operating in isolation. Uh, law is one of the instruments of of society. And in democracy, its impact should be balanced by, for example, uh, independent and free press, by a free and pluralistic civil society, um, by decent uh, avenues of repeal and recourse, by accountable parliaments and rule-based executive government. What has happened with really regressive uh, uh, court pronouncements such as Roe v Wade uh, and why they've been so extraordinarily difficult to resist has been the, the erosion over a number of years of democratic institutions and government and power loyalty to democratic values. So the court is very much in an ecology of its surrounding environment. And I think we really should notice that, that 
in a way, sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, gets overly treated as a boutique issue rather than being the litmus test or the isotope of what is going on in society uh, and whether the winds are uh, prevailing progressively or regressively. It is about the first issue, uh, certainly in our era, that um, regressive forces light upon to start to enable a manufacture of um, sec sectarianism or segmentation of us all into deserving and undeserving groupings of people. And unless you've got a free uh, impartial press, not owned by Rupert Murdoch, unless you've got free and pluralistic civil society, uh, uh, and in over 80 countries, the laws have been really regressing against civil society. But let me be very clear, we've never had any liberating, tra liberating transformative movements historically without civil society, unless you have an academy able to preserve and act independently for loyalty, uh, with loyalty to truth, to fact, and to science, and unless you have an accountable executive government, then, then the courts will do exactly what the courts in the US, uh, some of the courts are doing in the US. And then you have, you're really in deep trouble because of the uh, US's unique standing as a, as a global superpower, which it's been shoring up through this um, appalling conflict in Ukraine and the way it's been managing that. What happens is court, jurisprudence doesn't just stay in the court, it infects foreign policy. It infects foreign aid. It starts to set precedent for even more regressive governments to take strength from. And before you know it, uh, we're all in deep doo-doo. And believe you me, we're in doo-doo that is very deep. Uh, let me stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Amma, let me turn it back to you. And let me also just say, as you do that, just, just to, Kate, underline what you just said. Recently, somebody said to me that my work on SRHR was I worked on a niche issue. So just in terms of that, it's exactly your point. Sorry, uh, Ava, please. Um, so I went back and, you know, thought about the question and I think I'm going to take it in bits so that, you know, I am going according to the question. So in first part, as I understand it, um, how is SRHR understood here in Ghana? So that brings me back to something that Mr. Momin mentioned, Mr. Rahman mentioned early on when he said that the introduction of queer rights as part of uh, sexual and reproductive rights and, and in general as human rights is being rejected. They don't want to include it as a part of it. And that, if I understood you right, Mr. Rahman, is that what you were, yes. So I remember uh, two about two years ago when I think, uh, I'm not sure, but I think it was being introduced into parliament that they wanted to include, uh, you know, information on not just queer rights, but even in fact broaden the scope of topics that would be covered under sexual and reproductive rights. And immediately the general public, you know, there was an uproar and they immediately took it as uh, some private persons trying to infiltrate the the economy and, and their children's minds with queer. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, you're frozen. I'm so sorry. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Please forgive me. Can you hear me now? Now you're back. You're back. So they immediately wanted to take it as an attempt for some I don't know, privately sponsored persons to, you know, flood the schools and the children's minds and, you know, flood different institutions like schools, churches, and so on with queerness, right? And immediately they just closed the whole topic on that and didn't even want to investigate further. And I'm talking about the public's response. I'm not talking about what actually happened um, behind the scenes and in, in the parliamentary house, no. I'm talking about how the general public was responding to it. And so that is how I think that um, sexual and sexual and reproductive rights in general, especially when it's just tagged sexual and reproductive rights without fleshing it out to talk about what, the fact that it's an umbrella term for a wide variety of rights, you know, they just immediately want to shut it down. That is my experience, my personal experience, you know, 
and also how it's addressed. I, in my personal opinion, when that uproar happened, I did not, I was not convinced that, you know, the persons in the right places who were pushing this or people in the parliament or, you know, the right people who were to properly communicate the information. I don't think they did enough. And then it went crazy when the media just jumped in. You, you're, I'm going to, I'm going to move on because you're frozen again. Goodness, please give me. I can, no, please no, do don't, that. Please don't, do don't that. worry. We'll come back around. We'll come back around. No. Okay. So, okay. Uh, Rajat, please, you're, you're very politely put your hand up. So please, I, I must call upon you because you politely put your hand up. Thanks, Sophia. Um, very briefly, actually, I put my hand up when uh, in response to what Kate uh, uh, very right, nicely just uh, put up in her remarks. Um, the one place which I think this litmus test, as she called it, is playing out rather astutely is in the virtual space. And what we are seeing happening in the digital space, the disconnect uh, within that space between you know, law and practice, and in, in a lot of cases, the absence of any law to regulate. And it is, it is very rightly said, digital space is not a safe space today for sexual reproductive health and rights, for gender equality. What we are seeing is that there is a carte blanche that is with which some of the conversations and not just on the content being put on social media platforms, which is rife with mis and disinformation, misogyny and sexist content, which is being promoted through algorithmic models. So we need to start questioning in terms of what is happening here? Why is hate speech to the extent it is being rolled out with regards to the issues related to safe abortion, sexual health, sexuality, is not being dealt with. Is that to do with the business model of big tech company, which is allowing for these kind of information to be ripe and to be shared in this regard? Privacy and confidentiality is the big casualty in the way some of these decisions are being made. But we also have to ask who's making these decisions and why are they not making these decisions with regards to protection of these issues, but with regards to promoting content, which is misogynistic and sexist in its nature. And I think this is where we do see a big gulf between what law requires and what is happening in the virtual world. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Any thoughts on that? Um, it didn't, my, my intervention doesn't relate directly to um, uh, Rajat's point, but more the, the, the question as you posed it, I think, um, uh, and, and I'm coming at this from a health perspective, really is a, I, I think is is very um, it's, it's it's a really important consideration of uh, from a health perspective the impact of the law um, and its impact in health and the two the, the 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 two immediate examples that come to mind from our our perspective is our is our work here on um, the safer portion guidelines. Um, for instance, and uh, the work on gender-based violence, because those are those are two of the two of the areas where they're, they're very clear. Uh, uh, again, legal the, the the legal system messes with health uh, in a, in a very direct way. Um, I think one of the interesting things, and so um, uh, sorry, the the with the abortion uh, guidelines, for instance, the abortion work. Um, we have on the website, there is a, a whole um, a, a dashboard that looks at abortion policies across different countries. So you can look at that and, and have a, it provides an opportunity to, to really be able to do an analysis of the impact of the legal system um, where, where it is, where there, there are legal, um, uh, where, where abortion is criminalized. Um, being able to actually map it against the the uh, maternal deaths um, and and unsafe abortion and so on. So it's it's a real I, I think it's it's a it's a, a really um, serious and stark example of of where the problem is. But I also want to say that it it what that does also does is push us at least from the health perspective to think about what the what some of the solutions for this might be. So we can also look at. 
um, and, and the, the, the beauty of the, the abortion care guidelines that were released um, about this time last year, um, actually, is that what it does do is as a robust, strong, evidence-based, science-based document provides opportunities to ensure that women remain safe, that, that people remain, that, that we can focus on the outcome that we want, um, regardless um, of the law, I clearly it will be, it, you know, in terms of access issues and so on, it is still possible to be able to, uh, it, it is it's still important that, that, that we should be able to have autonomy over our own bodies. Um, but nonetheless, it, I, I think that they're really good ways of, of using the law as, a, as, a, as, a, as an enabler for us to be able to understand how we can enhance um, access to care, really look at the different problems. It's exactly the same, uh, similar sort of example with the work on gender-based violence as well, where, um, where, where women have tried to seek recourse or, or, or to be safe from intimate partner violence and all of that. And they are, they are clearly not protected in the way that the law is currently exists. Um, and, and then that then pushes us also to be able to one, uh, really um, demonstrate how important it is to have the right laws to support it, but also then look at look to see what other uh, mechanisms we have for recourse for what other mechanisms we have to ensure that we can still get the job that we need um, to get done. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm, I'm conscious of time. So what I'm going to propose is I'm going to pretend it's a game show and I'm going to ask for a lightning round where I'm going to ask everybody to go, uh, but you have one minute to, to respond to my question. Okay. So let's see if this works. But I, I, you know, one of the things that's really striking is that we're all dealing with in, in all the various places that we work locally, globally, different regions of the world, we're all dealing with humongous pushback right now in terms of what we're doing. And, and the question we keep coming back to is what's the pushback to the pushback, right? How do we think about this in, in a big way? And so I, I would like to ask each of you in terms of on the positive side, strategies that you've seen employed or that you're being, that you're part of, which is really in terms of trying to work even within restrictive of legal environments, so, something positive in terms of being able to think about this. Kate, can I start with you? Um, thank you. You know, historically, um, some of the best defense of our rights as human beings have come from universities and from student bodies. And I would say the first thing I want to affirm is that what we do within the academy and how we come into our adulthood with understanding these norms and values is crucial, not just for today, but essential for, the, for going forward. So the first thing I want to say, Sophia, get angry um, and, and, and retain that anger and fester it and foster it. Um, don't give up. The second thing is, honestly, if it didn't matter, if, it did, if language didn't matter, if identity wasn't key, if these intimate and a most precious of human rights that are where and how we can receive love and dignity. If it didn't matter, they wouldn't be on our backs. But they are on our backs, and as uh, Ginsburg would say, with their boot on our throats, because these things matter so much. From that, take great heart. And the third thing is that uh, organise, 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 and wherever people locally are organising for their right, building solidarity together, my goodness, extraordinary things happen, and that's what I think the equality, the marriage equality, uh, wins and the remarkable abortion wins in the least expected places um, uh, from uh, Ireland to Argentina uh, remind us just never bloody well give up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alma, can I turn to you? Yes. Hi. So one minute. Yes. Okay, let's go. <laughs> First, oh, what, I, what I did in my line of work as a digital creator was when I decided at first to take the route of going on Twitter and immediately I find something new in class, you know, something legal, a legal argument, a submission. I go and make it on Twitter because, you know, I was 19, a law student. I was excited. I knew the law. I wanted to share the law, you know, and the backlash was just really bad. And what I noticed was that the queer communities are 
more anxious because of the backlash that they are seeing. Because when some when I tweet something like that and someone comes back and is threatening or you know saying all, it's it just doesn't affect me. It affects my community and everyone that sees that tweet. So what it ends up doing is one, your message, my message on Twitter was not communicated. It was not received well, and two, it made my community more anxious. So then I thought wait, every other time that I, even my coming out video did not receive as much backlash. And then I noticed, in fact, coming out, when you're coming out and you're doing a coming out video, it's like, it's almost as if you're coming to seek for approval, maybe, or that's how certain people interpret it, right? So instead, I said, let me just go unap unapologetically and show my lifestyle as a queer person and share the experiences on my platforms. And when I did that, interestingly, I said, as of now, you can go through the comments. You would see about 1,000 comments and you can only find maybe at most two hate comments. And what does that do? People in the queer community come there and they see like, oh, oh my God, she represented us. So I chose representation instead of fighting legally and making legal submissions, right? What do I have? Four, four seconds left? What do I have? Tell me, Sophia. It's okay. 10, 9, 8, 7, go. <laughs> Okay, but yeah, basically I was showing representation. So one day come and they're like, oh, oh my God, this is me. This can't be me. I'm also a queer, I'm also a queer woman. I can have this experience. I can employ this strategy that you just said as, as to how you approach this woman. And secondly, I looked through the comments and oh my goodness, everyone is good in the comments. There's positive energy. Oh my goodness, what? Is this real? Is this our own little circle where we feel safe? You know, so that's what I noticed. I weighed the two and I noticed that that one was more effective. And that is not to say that those who are legally fighting, it's not effective that way. No. But for me and the position I was in, it was not even advantageous. It was very disadvantageous for me to fight the legal way as opposed to doing this. But Mind you, I was still trying to fight. So I chose the representation route. And sorry for taking 10 seconds more. Yeah, that's, okay. That's, okay. that's okay. Um, um can I go uh, Pascal to you? Um, sorry. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. I still have the unmute myself um button there. Um so I I I think um for me the the, the biggest the biggest word um is always listening i think they 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 are we need we need to look at critical alliances um and there there are alliances to be found it's very clear um from the the analyses of previous analyses that have been done that a lot of the work has moved forward because there have been movements and because different groups have come together over a over a, a shared agenda so we need we need to be um, cleverer, smarter about about uh, identifying and working with the alliances that are available. Uh, secondly, we need a significant significant dose of humility um, to get us to to understand that there are that we don't have all of the answers. That even if we are coming in on the side of science. Um, that we need to to be able to listen and 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 engage with um, people like um, Elom about really understanding what it's like and how we can use, what we can learn from that and how we can use it. Um, and the final piece I would say is absolutely the evidence as well. Um, but not just the the not just the evidence in the way that we have traditionally worked with it within the the, the um, academic community, but also being able to privilege different sorts of evidence. The reality is, whatever we think we know, whatever the the, the formula that we have, that does there are settings in which people are able to live their lives and move, move things ahead uh, without the knowledge that we think is the best possible evidence. How do we learn from that? How do we privilege that um, and draw on that to again, go back, circle back to this nature of alliance to be able to get that critical mass that we need to be able to move things forward. Thank you, uh, Mami. This is like positive things, right? Or things we think positive are working. Positive things, that's where we're okay, going. Positive things. Um, I'm thinking specifically here about, um, uh, you know, LGBT Muslims. I think one of the most important things that addresses some of the questions raised in the Q&A is, 
for those of us that have the ability in institutions or in academia, um, you know, uh, build um, build some space for those groups of people that we're missing or we think we you know we don't know about to get together digitally or physically or you know through dialogue um, so that they can tell us what their experiences are like and then perhaps we can translate them into a wider field right so that capacity building um, but you know autonomy and then the the responsibility for those of us that have some you know power to to, to translate that um don't avoid um impossible questions right sometimes we think okay we can't possibly discuss this because there's going to be such a huge backlash um that just means that there's a lot of power in that question and we start playing with that power we're going to see positive things you know like Elon said you, you're going to see people actually supporting, you know, a queer woman in Ghana, because the reality is we know that this diversity exists. People know that this diversity and that people have issues, you know, um, concerns around their sex lives and pleasure. And it's the politics of a country or a region or a group amplified by social media that makes it solidified into these dichotomies. And the light, light, sexual life is not dichotomies. Sexual life is kind of messy and everybody deals with it. We talk to each other about it, even in secret. And that's what we need to like, you know, spread out. Um, and compassion, I think going off Pascal's point, one of the things we're doing is trying to produce resources for Muslim families who have queer people within them. And not talking about the things that are gonna immediately be the problem, but find the terrain where we can talk about what you share, compassion, um, you know, being wanting someone to be part of the family, even though they're queer, um, those, you know, that's difficult and that takes research in the way that Kate said, but I think having compassion for um, people who may amplify or have hate, a lot of the times they're also dealing with fear, fear and crisis around um, environmentalism, around economic insecurity, around, well, if my daughter is queer, she's not going to have um, a secure economic life because she can't get married. And, you know, remembering that the reaction is always about broader crises that gets focused on often women's bodies, I think. And I think for the queer movement, the queer movement has to stop just thinking about queers and remember that this is about women and queers. It's a, it's a, it's a fight against patriarchy. It's not just a fight for specific identities. Thank you. Thank you. Words to live by. Um, uh, Rajat, please. Thanks, Sophia. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll be super quick. <laughs> um, but uh, four, four quick points. Uh, one, uh, I think the power of allyship and collective action is everybody has in a way touched upon that and it goes to the heart. We do not live, uh, as I said uh, recently elsewhere, single issue lives are successes and solutions cannot be single issue either. Where we have succeeded, it's where we have found common cause with each other's movements and worked together. Second um, is the space for civil society organization. One of the biggest threats that we face today is the lack of civic space in multiple countries, in every region around the world. Civil, civil society is today under the greatest threat it has ever been. Third is the issue that we have to take seriously, not tokenistically, which is respecting the power and agency of young people. Young people as activists, as agents of change, not just a tick box exercise when we are talking about and where we actually see young people on the decision making table as part of the collective, we are seeing concrete action starting to come through. My final point is we need to fund feminist movement and LGBTI group. This work needs to be resourced. Any donors on the call really do look into it because this is one way we can actually achieve concrete action in a manner that it would not be achieved otherwise. This will all re remain an academic conversation. Back to you. Thank you for that dose of reality. And I cannot believe this, but we're at time. It, it kills me. It kills me because it feels like we're in a conversation that is just kind of beginning and launching. And I, I just, you know, let me start by just thanking everybody who spoke for your vision, vision for your st strategic 
kind of approach to this for the, the comments, but but also your engagement. And, and I, I just think there's so much that's embedded in everything that you all have said that just is so much about everything we all need to do now in this time of narrowing space for sexual and reproductive health and rights. And I hope that we can kind of grow and, and engage with each other's energy and be able to kind of be able to move forward together. I, I wanna thank the audience for, all the, for being with us, but I really wanna thank you amazing panel for the work you do, but also just for this incredible conversation. Um, we will put up a slide as, as we go, just to be able to show a summer program we're running, which is attempting to try to engage with these issues. Um, and please do check this out if you are interested. And with that, I just thank you all. And um, you know, let's keep the conversation alive and keep it going. <laughs>